All right, uh, let's go to our Bible lesson. Turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 9. Hebrews, chapter 9. Last time, we read verses 11 through 14, but didn't get very far in commenting. Let's pick up those verses. We'll read them again. Hebrews 9, verses 11 through 14. But Christ, being come in high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling, to the, un sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit of offer himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And I did mention that verse 11 calls Christ a high priest of good things to come, but those things haven't appeared yet. We're waiting for them to come when yes. Christ returns. Uh, and he did this by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. Verse 12 says, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. Go, if you will, back to Acts chapter 20. Go to Acts and chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, and notice there verse 28. Paul admonishes the elders in the city of Ephesus, saying, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves, and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. We can safely conclude that the blood of Jesus Christ is called the blood of God in the Word of God, in the Bible. Most people have never heard of that. What's well, right there on the page. Why haven't you heard of it? We well, see where they start changing the Bible, rewriting the Bible, altering texts in the Bible, changing mm -hmm. words in the Bible. Mm -hmm. They destroy the whole system of cross references already built in to the King James uh, text. But uh, in order to understand verses 11 and 12, we need to look forward in the same chapter. Go forward, and we'll begin there with verse 22, verses 22 to 24. It says in verse 22, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. So you often hear a preacher, a soul winner, preach that without shedding of blood there's no remission for sins. This is where they get that phrase from, they derive that phrase from. But technically, verse 9, or verse 22, uh, is referring to the blood of animals before the coming of Christ. It says, uh, without shedding of blood is no remission. And remission is different than removal. And that's why the context here was the animals before the coming of Christ. Think of a cancer patient whose cancer cells, wherever the cancer may be, are said to be in remission through treatment and, and medical uh, treatment. They're not growing at the moment. They're not spreading anywhere. They're lying dormant. But they're not gone. They haven't been removed, haven't been excised from the body. So the cancer is in remission, but it hasn't been removed. And this is what the animals in the Old Testament were able to accomplish. They were able to remit the sin. That sin would be forgiven when the, a guilty party brought an offering to the Levites. But the sin wouldn't be removed from the record of that man or woman. And the next time they sinned, they had to bring another animal. This was what God had commanded. Now, let me re repeat what I've said a number of times. The animals were not equal to the man in value. They were below the man. As a matter of fact, God had given man dominion over the animals, Genesis chapter 1. But that was the offering God had commanded nevertheless. And every time he sinned, he had to bring another animal and another animal. What man needed was an offering that was not only equal to him in value, but infinitely greater than him in value, so that 
it wouldn't have to be repeated. It could be done once and get it, get it over with. Yeah. And that was the coming and that was the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on behalf of sinners. So those animals were foreshadows. They were types, pictures of Christ who would come. But the one offering the animal had no idea about Christ. He was just told that this is how my sins will be forgiven. And um, in order, so so in these verses here, verse 22, 23, 24, I want you to notice a number of things. Notice that heaven itself, mentioned in verse 24, is the true antitype of the Mosaic tabernacle in the wilderness. Moses' tabernacle pictured heaven in some way. Also notice the holy places up there are made without hands. They're said to be the true in verse 24. And there are heavenly things, according to verse 23, that had to also be purified with blood. Read verse 23 again. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. That is, these earthly things were patterns of something much higher. And they were purified when the animals were slain. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Verse, uh, point number four of that, the earthly things then were uh, types of those things above. Verse 23, they're called patterns. And Christ, as the true high priest, goes into the true holy places, mentioned in verse 24, by means of his own blood, as mentioned back in verse 12. The little word by, verse 12, by his own blood he entered, that's a great placement by the Holy Spirit in our Bible. We're King James Bible believers. We're not King James Bible users. Mm -hmm. We're not King James Bible preferers. We're not simply partial to it because we like the old English. We believe it is the Word of God. And it's not simply a representative of the Word of God. It is the Word of God. Amen. Um, you don't have to go back and reinvent the wheel about every three or four years and with a new version. Mm -hmm. The wheel was perfected in 1611. Now it's simply adapted to different vehicles. Japanese cars, German cars, <laughs> and so forth. And clumsy American cars that have to be replaced about every two or three years. But uh, the wheel was perfected. Now it's just adapted. Uh, it's, it's, it's been adapted to Korean cars, right? Mm -hmm. King James, Korean King James Bible. Think of the Kia, the Hyundai. I don't think of those cars, but think of something better. Um, and it's being adapted to China. There are Chinese translations being worked on now. It's been adapted to French cars. What's the French car? Renault. Renault? Renault. Citroën. Citroën? Fiat. Citroën is a French car? We had a family down the street from us who had about yeah. six or seven of those Citrons. <clears throat> they were the most ugly things, but they were cheap and they were, they were efficient. And um, so that, this is a, a Catholic family. I think they had eight kids. And every one of those kids learned to drive in a Citron. It's big, fat, ugly things and just... Oh. Very comfortable. <laughs> really comfortable? Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> I can probably say I never rode in one. <laughs> but anyway... Um, so we believe the Bible was perfected in 1611 not to go back and reinvent the wheel with a new version. And as professing believers, we believe every word in our Bible is there by the placement of the Holy Spirit and the, the will of God. So that it's not our job to change the Bible. The Bible's job is to change us. Amen. And bear that in mind. That's a little Mike Shriveism. The Bible's, I'm not to change the Bible. The Bible's job is to change me. And uh, Brother Todd had some bumper stickers made. I think I'm going to have that put on a bumper sticker as well. I had another one. You might like this one. I came up with. The success of modern Bibles is measured by sales generated. 
rather than souls regenerated. Mm. My wife's saying, hey, not bad, honey. <laughs> Good for me. But anyway, <clears throat> um, that little word by, B-Y, is a great placement by the Holy Spirit. It negates the word with, found in so many modern translations. There's a strange idea being taught all over this country that Christ somehow carried his blood, his human blood, from Calvary all the way to the third heaven and then sprinkled it upon the mercy seat in the third heaven once he uh, ascended there in some metaphysical way. Uh, the, new rev the Revised Standard Version says, with his own blood, not by his own blood. The New King James Version says, with his own blood. Today's English version of the Good News Bible, he took his own blood there. And ditto the New Living Translation, he took his own blood uh, to the third heaven or to the, to the holy place. I want you to pay very, very close attention to this right here. Nowhere in this entire chapter does it say Jesus Christ sprinkled blood on anything in the third heaven. Read it very carefully. You won't find that uh, found anywhere in this chapter. Nowhere does it say he sprinkled anything in the third heaven. But by his own blood shed at Calvary, everything was effected in the third heaven by that sacrifice of himself. Uh, look at verse 14 again. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself, so forth and so on. It wasn't, and it wasn't just the death of Christ for the sinner, that's important, but the Bible says it was the shedding of Jesus Christ's blood that did the job. God told the Israelites, Exodus 12, verse 13, When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Mm. When the angel of death went through the camp. And for the Christian today, the Bible says, If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. 1 John 1, verse uh, 7. And if it was the blood of God, as Acts 20, verse 28 said that it was, and God is eternal, God told Moses, Exodus 3, 14, I am that I am. And the Lord Jesus said in John 8, verse 58, before Abraham was, I am. God simply exists. God has always existed. There was never a time when God didn't exist. And there will never be a time in the future when God doesn't exist. Everything we see around us, all known reality, as I referred to in our sermon time, time, space, matter, all of those things that constitute reality were created by God. God is outside of any sense of reality we could see or, or observe. God is outside of those things, and so he's not bound or limited by any of those things. Those things, as magnificent as they are, as seemingly infinite as they, they appear to be to the naked eye, they are nevertheless part of God's creation. He is greater than all of it. The Mormon gods, or the Mormon God that they worship from this planet, they say lives uh, beyond a star called Kolob on a planet on the other side of that star. I don't know if they've ever identified any such planet named Kola, but that's nevertheless the Mormon story, that God dwells on a planet within the universe, and from there, he and his multitude of spirit wives are just conceiving babies all the time. God's very, very busy conceiving more babies with all of his wives. And those spirits are born, they come into the world, and are born to earthly parents, and somehow it's their job to struggle and figure out the plan, the God's, the Mormon's plan of salvation, to become a God, get baptized in the Mormon temple, and then go on, 
and then he will become a god, she will become a goddess and the bride of God, and it will be her job then to produce spirit babies for the next world, and the next world, and the next world. They say this has been God's operation from eternity. It's always been that way. Get on the internet sometime, type in world population census, or world census information, and uh, you'll see it come up one or two, you might have to click one or two places to get to it, you'll see a, a counter which is subtracting all the people, the number of people on the earth as deaths occur. Every nine, ten seconds there's another death in the world, and it's just subtracting from the world's total population as people die. It's, it's approximate, right? Because they don't know exactly when, but on the average it's subtracting. And then next to it there will be a counter adding a new person to the world about every five seconds, every four seconds. There's a new person born into the world somewhere. And so between these two, they're going in up in different directions, the population of the world is gradually increasing. So as I say, God's a very busy God following babies with all of his wives in the unseen world. How he has time to worry about your special undergarments or, or to run the world is a, a strange thing indeed. I meant to say this during our sermon time. Maybe it's just as well that I didn't, but you and I trust that the Holy Spirit will watch out for us. He... How many of you ever had some close call on the freeway or on the road, and if it wasn't God somehow stepping in to steer you one direction or another, you would have been plowed over by somebody else? How many have had some kind of near miss like that? Just about everybody. And you look back now and say, thank God, I wasn't hurt, the car didn't get hit, and so forth. I was driving on an interstate when we lived in Pensacola. And I was transitioning from one north and south freeway to an east-west freeway on that transition uh, connection. Somebody was hitting the side, the side railing, the concrete railing, and metal and debris flying off their car all over the place. And my car sailed right through all that falling debris. Not a single piece hit my car. It was just, and, and I didn't get hurt. I just kept on driving. I said, I haven't got time to go check and see if someone's hurt. It, it, but the idea that, that you say, well, that's just coincidence. Well, I suppose there are probably some coincidental elements to it, but I don't deny that God was watching out for me. Amen. Mormons believe that by wearing their special undergarments, they call them their temple garments, their special underwear under their clothing, that is the same thing as the Holy Spirit's protection. That's their interpretation. If we wear this, it reminds ourselves and reminds God of our covenants we've made with Him and so forth. And uh, He watches out for us. I used to work with a guy at a car dealership in Montclair, uh, Paul Evans, or Paul Ebbs, rather. And he was the LDS, Mormon. He said he had a accident his little pickup truck had rolled over and the, the cab over his head didn't crush in because he believed he was wearing his undergarments and what God watched out for him because of it. So um, those are some pretty magic underwear to uh, mm. bring in, you know, and wearing them. How many are wearing them now? Anybody? Fruit of the loom. Yep, yep. Yeah. Dr. Ruckman used to joke and say, blessed be the fruit of the loom. <laughs> in mocking moment Catholicism. <laughs> but so if it was God's blood and God is eternal, he had no beginning, he'll have no ending, then only the physical elements of the blood um, dried up on on Golgotha, the foot of the cross that day. But his blood is still an eternal agent, um, able to cleanse the sins of any sinner even today. Thank the Lord for that. 
Verse 14 offers one of the most um, precious promises to a believer uh, it found anywhere in the entire Bible. Let's read verse 14 again in its entirety. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? It's about gaining personal victory over the sins of the mind, and the sins of the imaginations. Look back, if you will, at 2 Corinthians. Go back to 2 Corinthians and chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And let's begin there with verse 3. Actually, 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 5. Paul says there, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You are engaged in a spiritual conflict, mm. spiritual <clears throat> combat, battle. You might not be conscious of it all the time, but in the unseen world, and I mentioned this a few weeks ago in our sermon, that there's a spiritual a battle taking place in the invisible, unseen world between heaven and hell, between God and the forces of Satan uh, to destroy you as a Christian, or if you're not saved, to keep you from becoming a Christian, to interrupt when someone's trying to give you a tract, to interrupt when someone's trying to talk to you about Jesus Christ, to distract your attention off of some other thing. Doesn't matter what it is. As long as Satan can distract your attention and get your mind off of your spiritual need for Jesus Christ, your, your spiritual need to be saved, he's won a victory. He's done what he needs to do. Just keep you from facing the fact that you're a sinner and you need to be forgiven. Or if you are saved, to keep you from being fruitful or doing anything for the honor of God and the, and the glory of Jesus Christ. Keep you stumbling around and falling prey to temptation and giving in to your flesh. Once again, I'm a bad Christian and always messing up. If he can get you to do that and be completely ineffectual mm -hmm. as a believer, he's won a victory. That's all he needs to do. And uh, although he can't, say, he can't drag your soul to hell, he can make sure when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, you've got very little coming your way. Mm -hmm. You don't think the devil knows the Bible? He knows the Bible better than anyone on the earth. It's a strange mystery, though. You'd think that knowing the Bible better than any mortal man, Satan would see his doom depicted on the pages of it. Mm -hmm. And yet, through pride, he's going to still try to uh, fight against Jesus Christ. But... Um, the verse says the blood of Christ is able to purge your conscience. According to Webster's Unabridged Dictionary, to purge means to rid of whatever is impure or undesirable, to cleanse, to purify. That's what the blood of Christ, uh, which was shed on the cross, past tense, can do for you now, present tense, and can still do in the future if you sin again. If we confess our sins, the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 8. So uh, you can claim the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus Christ and then apply it to your need right now. I'm so glad for that. Yeah. The idea that, that blood shed on a cross 2,000 years ago is still uh, able to uh, affect the salvation of a soul and the the cleansing of that soul and the forgiveness of the sins is a miracle indeed. My dad always concludes his funeral services this way by saying, I've never seen when they put the, hand, the nails in the hands of the Lord Jesus or when they nailed the nails into his feet. I've never seen when they thrust the spear into his side on Calvary. But I believe one day Jesus Christ was dying on the cross for my sins all the sins that I would one day commit. 
He died for my sins. He died for the sins of the deceased. Then he makes it personal. Then he died for your sins. Do you know him? And um, it's a very uh, beautiful way of bringing it home to the, to the person sitting out in the seat. That they need to make an examine their own heart to see if they're saved. But it can be applied to your need right now. Uh, the, the, the power of temptations over you, the past memories of things you did before you became a Christian, the past guilt that still eats away at you from day to day, all of those things can be purged and cleansed by claiming the blood of Jesus Christ as the agent to wash those things away. Now, let's read verses 15 to 24. And my eyes are still watering continually. So I apologize. Verses 15 to 24. And for this cause, he is the mediator of a New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all, whilst the testator liveth. Whereupon, neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled the blood both with, with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. We mentioned that a minute ago. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. We already considered some of this section. The previous section back in verse 13 said, uh, Sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, which referred to the activities of, uh, of the Levites in the book of Leviticus and Numbers. He says, how much more, verse 14, uh, meaning the blood of Jesus Christ, purge your conscience from dead works. Uh, we covered that a moment ago. The blood of Christ was, and still is, a purifying agent, uh, which can be applied to the sinner, exactly as the water and the ashes and the hyssop and everything else were sprinkled upon the sinner at that time. Now here, verse 15 says, He is the mediator of the New Testament, not according to most modern versions, not according to the ASV or the RV or the New ASV or the Revised Standard Version, not according to the NIV and all the others. Uh, to, according to them, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant. And they've taken the word testament out. But I want you to notice the word covenant means a formal agreement between two or more parties to either do or to not do something. And, uh, but it requires both parties to still be alive to enforce its, its stipulations. Uh, the word covenant is a a subordinate definition, a secondary definition of the word testament in the dictionary. But they're not synonyms with each other. They have slightly different meanings. As I say, covenant has to do with two people who are still living, uh, able to enforce the terms of that agreement. A testament is something that that um, is a legal document disposing of someone's personal property after they die. Think of last will and testament. So the testament is of no effect if the testator is still alive. It only goes into effect, into effect after the person who's made it dies. And then all the blessings, in this case, uh, that 
promise to come to the sinner by Jesus Christ are only yours after he died. And I got to thinking about this as I was preparing this morning. The, I, mentioned, I mentioned the mentally retarded idea that Calvary Chapel ministers are espousing these days, that uh, people in the Old Testament were saved somehow <clears throat> looking forward to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They were sort of saved on, by faith on credit. And one guy on the radio every day on the Calvary Chapel talk show uh, says they died and went to heaven, went to the presence of God. They did not. The death of Jesus Christ couldn't benefit anybody until after it That's had right. happened. That's right. And I mentioned, I think I used this illustration. When I was 45, I was expecting my senior discount at McDonald's, right? <laughs> but I didn't get it until I turned 55. I could hope for it all I want. You know, if, if you're lucky, you get some 17-year-old kid that doesn't know better. He gives you the, the cheap price on the coffee anyway because he thinks you're an old guy. You know, you're 45, you're, you're a geezer <laughs> to a 17-year-old kid. But, but you get the point. Hoping for something, you won't receive it until the, the, the necessary requirement. In this case, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is what made the blessings that flow from it now available to the sinner. When in the Old Testament, men were commanded to have an animal sacrifice for their sins. And if they were faithful to this, they were considered righteous in the Old Testament sense of the term. Someone who was known for doing more good than bad was considered a righteous man. He was called a good man. He was called a faithful man, a just man. You read that term all over the place in the book of Psalms, describing the attributes and the habits of a just man, as opposed to someone who is known for doing more bad than good, he was called an evil man, a wicked man, a vile man, a contemptible man, an unjust man, an unrighteous man. And people can mistakenly think that God's um, way of measuring you or qualifying you for heaven is still the same way today. My good deeds outweigh my bad deeds and so forth. So if a man died, and, and that system of keeping the laws and commandments given by God had to be maintained all the way until death. Read Ezekiel chapter 18, about verses 23-24 along in there. You'll see if a man uh, turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, all his righteousness which he hath done shall be forgotten in his sins and in his iniquities which he hath done in them shall he die. So that obedience had to be maintained until the time he died. But when you died, it still didn't get you to heaven. It can only get you as far as the place of comfort we call Abraham's bosom. If you died in, uh, as a righteous man in the eyes of God, you go to a place we refer to as Abraham's bosom, but that was simply the place of comfort. And uh, Luke 16, the Lord Jesus talked about the Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus died uh, righteous. The rich man who had everything and died without God, and when they woke up in, in the unseen world, Lazarus was comforted in the bosom of Abraham, and the rich man, the Bible says, in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom, so that Calvary Chapel minister is off his rocker, because if a person, he said, well, um, Lazarus simply died and went someplace where the comfort of God was, well, how is it that they could communicate with people in a hell? How they end up in the same place. The JW say the word hell simply means the graveyard. It's another euphemism for the cemetery. Well, how did Abraham and Lazarus and the rich men all end up in the same grave then? If that's what hell means. And the, the rich man said, I am tormented in this flame. <clears throat> so hell is a place of torment, and there was a gulf dividing those two parts. On the other side was a place of comfort where Abraham was had Lazarus up against his bosom comforting him. But we refer to it as Abraham's bosom, probably incorrectly, but that's what we call it anyway. And so the, the, the person before the coming in the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ wasn't saved on credit, hoping for it. In the Book of Mormon, I can find you four places, four references, follow me down in my office afterwards if you want to see them, where they talk about people in the so-called Old Testament period looking forward to the coming 
uh, the death and burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ who would come. And on that basis, they were deemed righteous with God. Well, the righteousness of Christ isn't yours until he's actually died right. and proven that righteousness. Right. So, but a testament is a legal document disposing of someone's property after they die. And look at verse uh, 16. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. So the word testament covers all possibilities. It's a much better word than covenant, since the context is the blessings which resulted from the death of Jesus Christ. If Christ hadn't died, then the testament would not be in effect. The blessings, what they call the Old Testament, or the previous testament, uh, meant the blessings that would come to the sinner by means of killing the animal. When the animal was dead, that sin would be forgiven or remitted. But it wasn't washed away, it wasn't cleansed. Uh, chapter 10, verse 4 says, For the, it's not possible for the blood of bulls and of goats to uh, take away sins. So the Old Testament had to do with the death of the animal and the blessings that would come from that. The New Testament are the blessings that come from the death of Jesus Christ. And it covers other definitions of covenant underneath it as well. Testament is a much better word because it, it describes something that is already accomplished by the death of the person who makes those terms, sets those terms. Um, 